Have you seen something strange in the northwestern Ontario woods? If you have, Dee McCulley wants to hear from you. The Red Rock filmmaker has begun work on a documentary about the legendary Sasquatch. Man has existed on this continent for thousands of years in the vast region of Lake Superior on the 49th parallel. Such creatures exist. The natives of this land named it, called Zabe, to others, Bigfoot or Sasquatch. What follows are the accounts of those who have witnessed the mythical being. When I was eight, I remember uh, our family was in the front yard talking about what things they heard in the bush. and. Uh, it comes down to, we heard screams recently in the bush, and someone said it was uh, bears, a bear will sound a lot like a man way out in the middle of the bush, and you might go to sea and then you'll, you, you might think it's a man that's hurt, you go to sea and you'll find some bears there. And uh, then, when they were talking about screams, there was a scream in the, in the bush behind us. Uh, I think it was to the uh, to the east so we all looked towards the mountain and there was nothing there to look at there was just a bunch of trees and uh, the mountain and then shortly seconds after that there was a second screen beside us to the uh, to the west so we turn and look and there was just one tree moving so it led me to it makes me think that something was hanging onto the top of the tree and jumped off and let it go and screamed at the same time so that you watch this shaking tree while it makes its getaway. Um, so there's that. And uh, the other instance I have is about 10 years later at the same place on uh, Red Rock Reserve. I was up by the mountain and uh, I was uh, alone and I threw a rock through the bush and something threw a rock at me from behind me, alongside the mountain. And I'm thinking, what, did my cousin come back? Maybe it was him. After a while, it became apparent there wasn't anybody out there but me. So I'm thinking, what, what is, what was throwing this rock? Maybe it's a bird drop something? What, because, you know, blackbirds drop stuff. Then I could hear, clack, 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 clack. And um, then I could hear, clack, crunch, crash. You could hear the, the uh, rocks crumble. I'm right beside the mountain and I'm thinking, geez, there got to be, someone's playing a good joke on me, so I should go there and see what's going on. So I got my gander up and I went over there. I went to the, I, I, I know sounds in the bush. I'm sure a lot of people who are spending a lot of time in the bush, they know where the sound come from. I went to the spot. I couldn't find no broken rocks. In fact, I couldn't find two rocks to click together beside the mountain. I couldn't find two rocks. So I, I was I was wondering, what, what was making this noise? I couldn't find any scratches on the on the mount on the side of the mountain. Nothing. I couldn't find. I couldn't find nothing. So I got extremely weirded out and scared and concerned for my own safety. So I decided to leave. And on the trail going back out, I encountered trees as big as my finger that were snapped right at my eye height and at my forehead height that forced me to go under them, under those trees to uh, continue on the trail and a little bit further down the trail there was about uh, I would say at least five trees as big as my wrist that were pulled up with the roots still intact and in the way they were jammed in the way on the trail. Okay, the trees um, when they were jammed together were they like um, were they up against each other like uh, how you they were uh, they weren't sticking into the ground they were more or less hung up by other sticks and other trees vines or whatever that, that could they were just small trees they weren't humongous big trees but they were one was upside down and the us the other ones had their roots ripped out of the ground but they were touching they were almost touching none of them in fact none of them were touching the ground that's right none of them were touching the ground they were they were all jammed together and hung up by other branches and twigs and stuff in the way. I was I started to look. You could see fresh dirt on the bottom of the roots, and the roots were white where they got ripped. 
So I saw the fresh dirt and I saw the, the roots were ripped and I decided to start looking around where for the holes in the bush where this, these, those trees were brought there. They weren't ripped in that location. They were brought and jammed there. And uh, that's when I really got a good, good scare and decided to get home. And uh, the only other thing I have on from Red Rock Reserve there is uh, there was a couple guys and myself working up behind St. Sylvester's Church. We were two hours up the trail on Skidoo, uh, two hours walking, so it's probably 20 minutes on Skidoo. And um, one of the fellows come up to me and says, uh, "Was anybody walking back here?" And there's there's nobody, there's no there is nobody there that could walk. Okay, there's no houses back there. There's no people living back. There's nothing back two hours behind that church. There's nothing there except a lake and a trail. And uh, he says, uh, come and see. I got to show you guys something. So we went to where he was working, and you could see there was fresh snow that morning. You could tell he never walked where he was pointing, and there was humongous footprints that were... Um, bigger than my work boot right beside the uh the uh, cedar tree line right i mean i mean right beside the tree line i mean i know dogs i know deer i know trails in the bush bears even will walk on your trail this thing didn't walk on the trail it walked right beside the cedar trees it, in fact it crossed over the trail and didn't step on the trail it stayed as close to the trees as it possibly could and it was a big thing, and there, you could see the needles that were on the ground. So it wasn't it wasn't that long ago that it walked by those trees. And the only thing I have to say is uh, there wasn't a, a good enough footprint that we could tell which way it was walking, but I know it wasn't where we were working. And once in a while you get the feeling like something was watching. And I, I'm pretty sure that was like the last week that we were working up there. The question is, do you believe there are creatures um, behind St. Sylvester's in that area? I think there is at least two Sasquatch Bigfoot back there. I think one, the one when I was 16, I think he was about, he was a young Sasquatch or Bigfoot. I think it was a young one that was watching me. The only thing that I've heard about uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch from uh, a person or a couple of old guys from uh, Rocky Bay or McDermott was that he stinks. <laughs> he stinks like you, you, you'll get a very, very bad smell of um, feces, I guess, and body odor maybe, but it, he said it's nothing, it's nothing like a dog, it's nothing like a bear. It's a completely different smell altogether, but I've, I've never encountered a smell like that. Well, okay, there was uh, a, a man and his daughter who witnessed Bigfoot walk across the road and up into the tree line that was very, very close to uh, McDermott. They were out on the highway. On Highway 11, two men were hunting around what is called Dead Man's Curve. As they trudged through the woods, miles off the highway, they heard snapping in the distance. As one of the hunters raised his rifle and looked through the scope, dead in his sights was something he'd never forget. Whatever it was was covered in long, dark hair, but was said to be wearing overalls like that of a mechanic. The hunter watched it until it was out of his view and deep into the woods. Is it possible this was an old-time prospector who wore his clothes so long his hair grew through them? The very same has happened in recent history in these parts. Or was it a Sasquatch? Highway 11 has its stories. About 2006 to 2008, I don't remember the year exactly. It was, you know, I was just 10 years ago at least. Um, heading up to Longlock to work in the lumber mill. I was uh, working for a computer company that contracted to them to do all their IT stuff. So I was just had my laptop, heading up to go to work regular, like it was like a Tuesday or something, you know. Uh, it was about 6 a.m. I had to leave early to get to the mill to start my work day at 8. So it was really early in the morning. And it was January, February, you know, middle of winter, minus 30. I remember the weather specifically because I 
my car like barely started. I was like, man, I gotta get to Long Lack. Like this thing better go. So and that car didn't have good heat at the time. So I remember that too. It took forever just for the car to warm up. So it was like a bitterly cold day. Um, I was driving, like I said, maybe like 40 minutes from the turnoff, went nipping up to Highway 11. So deep in the bush. I don't remember if it was like before or after Beardmore. That I can't remember, but it was deep in the northern bush, um, somewhere where there's like, there's no logging roads. There's no access highways up north. There's no driveways, there's no camps. There's just nothing, it's just bush. Um, it was, like I said, early in the morning. I'm listening to music, just chilling, drinking my coffee, trying to stay awake. And you know, I'm driving and I just glance in my rearview mirror. And in the tree line along the side of the highway, so they're not on the highway, but just out of the tree line, I saw what appeared to be a tall, like I would describe it as a shadow, just a tall black figure, step out of the tree line, just hang out for like a second and just turn around and walk back into the bush. And you know, I can't, I didn't see it directly. I didn't have a line of sight, so I couldn't say how tall it was, but from the distance it was, it seemed really tall. And it was just a shadow. It was just head to toe black. So, you know, people don't dress like that or not normally. And like, I hadn't even passed a car, let alone seen a parked car for a good 20 minutes. Didn't see one for 20 minutes the other direction. And like I said, there was no roads, no driveways, nothing. So just the middle of nowhere, shadow steps out of the bush. So not even on the road, just enough to you know, distinguish itself from the trees. So it was just, it was just a shadow. But that was that. In the 1980s, two hunters were hunting deer at Trout Lake. Both had a lot of experience in the woods, but this day something was different. As they neared the lake, they heard a wildly loud scream. So loud and strange it had left the hunters scared out of their wits. One turned to the other, cocking the rifle bolt, saying, let's get the hell out of here. The two fled home. It was back in uh, about 1982, back in Long Lake, Ontario. Um, I went out with my dad and my uncle, and we went out to Camp 43, where uh, just maybe about 12 kilometers outside of Long Lake. And uh, so we went out with my uncle's truck and uh, we got there and we were he was getting some of the soft yellow sand for his home and uh, while they were loading it up and I was about 15 years old then and then I was looking around and I seen these tracks and I looked at them and I was shocked because they were like 12 to 14 inches long at least and I looked at them and I told I remember telling my dad and my uncle, I said, look at these tracks. These are the same ones that were on TV, the Sasquatch. And so they kept working, putting the sand into the truck. And then um, I followed the tracks and, and you can see the depressions in that soft sand, like anything, like even your, your, um, your sneakers. And I kept following and I came to a, a little road and I walked over the road and on the other side of the road, I looked to see where where the tracks went. And it was a very open uh, bush area. It was all jack pines and open rock faces. And uh, I looked down and I seen the depression in the moss. The, it must have been pushed down at least 10, 12 inches deep. That's all. And, and the size of the footprints were the same as what they were on the sand, where I couldn't, so I followed the tracks were one, two, just like a person walking, but they were so depressed into the moss, it was freaky. So I kept walking and walking, and then I looked behind and I said, man, I'm about 200 feet from the road. I better head back, and that's when I headed back, and um, I went to tell dad and my uncle that uh, I followed these into the bush, and then I stopped because I was too scared to go any further. And uh, so that was, that's my uh, my story with the with Bigfoot or Sasquatch. As the powwows of native culture make their way around the lake from reservation to reservation, it is said Sasquatch is drawn to it, following each to the next, to the pounding of the drum and the native song.
It is also stated in native belief that he is a water protector, which would explain why he is seen around large bodies of water. We're about 60 kilometers east of Matheson, Ontario, uh, up in the region there by Timmins. And, uh, and I've been working in the bush for a long time. I've actually had already about 17 years experience in Northwestern Ontario, um, fighting fires, slash pile burning. Uh, I, I've also did some uh, timber cruising. So I've been uh, working in the bush and I, was, I considered myself experienced at the time because I've seen everything. I've even seen cougar, uh, caribou, you name it. So to me, uh, the Bigfoot was always just a, a West West Coast myth. It was never anything that crossed my mind. Um, so when we were working that day, uh, when the event started, uh, it was easy for me to to justify what was going on in my mind. So we worked in the plot, <clears throat> and we we aged trees in a in a circumference area that we had uh, measured out and we we, we uh, measured their diameter using a little tape so we were in there for over an hour we finished measuring up the trees and then I went out and I did some test trees I spray painted the test trees I got down and I was using an increment bore to age the the tree and I was pulling out the core I, and I did one I did hear a little bit of noise coming from this direction, from the way I was standing. There was a little bit of noise over there, didn't bother me, kept working. My partner came up and then uh, he took the, the tool, he started aging uh, the, the last tree, test tree three. At that point, then we started hearing like a rotten tree just getting ripped open, eh? So to me, that's like a bear rummaging, he's eating insects and whatever so we even took a look man we didn't see nothing we didn't see nothing but i i did kind of get nervous because the sound was really close i would have said maybe it sounded like it was within 30 feet of us i said i'm gonna go get the i'm gonna go get the can of bear spray so he was like all right so i walked back to the center of the plot and i just grabbed my vest put my vest on i came back and i said I said, is it still over there? And he says, actually, you could hear it kind of walk around. It's over here. So uh, I'm listening there, letting him finish up. I'm listening, and you can actually hear like, you know, something's walking back over there. And I said, oh, it's going away. I said, nothing to worry about. So we went back to the center of our plot. We measured off the distance so that we could have a record of where we took our soil sample. And we used a auger. We got that auger down on the ground. We pulled the soil out. And then uh, my partner's down on the ground again, because I don't know how to test oils. That guy's the pro and I'm just a lead, ha or uh, I'm actually just a, a, you know, a helper, eh? So he's there <clears throat> and he's, he's doing the soil test. And I was, I'm standing there and I got the, I got like an aluminum clipboard and I'm taking all his notes. And all of a sudden you hear, you know, and I look up and this huge freaking tree root just comes flying at us, eh? And uh, so anyways, it comes flying at us, it lands on the ground and it hits the ground hard, uh, hard enough where I got debris, you know, I'm brushing off and my partner's standing up and he goes, and I go, what the f***, like, you know, it was a, it was a big chunk of root bro boomerang shape and and it was dark and wet. So it was kind of, you could tell this thing was just ripped from the ground somewhere. So it left a lot of questions in our heads right there, eh? Like, what the f through that? And through the canopy like that. So anyways, I was still like looking there. Then I seen another stick coming. And it was coming right at me, man. I moved, you know? I kind of moved back and this, this stick comes down and I go, that's somebody. That's somebody that's doing that. So, and we did have another crew, but they were not near us, they were up in Cochrane. And uh, we knew that, but I still, I, I still yelled out, I was like, Ryan, 
I go, but that's somebody. So I went running over there. I just went freaking bush crashing because I seen that trajectory, right? And I go bush crashing over there. And as I am, all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden I see like a, a haystack as I'm coming through. And, I'm, and I stop and I go, oh, I don't know how a haystack get in here, you know? So I knock down a few more branches. I get in closer and then I see this big, big, you know, eight foot tall Sasquatch. And he's trying to hide. He's actually like this, with his head cocked down. And he's like standing, he's like he's totally still. But you know the breeze? You can see the hair. Like, a, you, you know it's hair, you know? Wisps. Everything is moving in the breeze, eh? And I look, and I, my legs just tighten right up. Because the first sense I got was by seeing it trying to hide, was the intelligence that this creature had. And and it's a man. It's just an ancient man, you know? And he's huge. He, this thing could put a moose in a headlock and rip it down. Like, that's how tall it was. Strong, muscular. So, I, I lost my breath, you know? My legs tighten up. And then, and then I'm like, okay, I gotta look away because if it's trying to hide and it turns and sees that I'm seeing it, it's not gonna be happy, you know? because his cover is blown. So, so at that moment, I stopped looking and then I, just, and I, I started to back off and I'm trying to be quiet and I turn around and I start walking back to my partner and, uh, and I stop and I go, I want to go take another look, you know? I want to go look at it again. But I'm scared, man. My heart's just thumping too. Like, you could hear my heart beat in my ears, eh? And uh, so I said, no, just keep going. And then I got back to Luke and, and he's working there and he goes, He's like, uh, he goes, what was it? And I said, we gotta go. And he goes, all right, you know. I said, we gotta get out of here now, I said. So we gathered up our tools. And uh, I didn't wanna tell him because we were like 700 meters in the bush. I didn't wanna tell him because I was scared that I might scare him. And he's the only guy with the GPS to get us back to the truck, right? So I was just like, everything is going through my mind, man. Like, man, I saw. Bigfoot, I saw him. He's he's real. He's out there. And uh, so we we start walking, tracking back out with uh, our tools. And I had the soil auger. And we get back out to the truck, and we're doing a little inventory there because we're gonna have something to eat. I'm excited. I just saw like the craziest thing on the planet. And he's puzzled, like, what the hell did you see? You know, and I'm not telling him. And I'm at the point now where I'm not ever going to tell my partner. You know, I don't want to be crazy. And uh, so, and then we're doing our little inventory there. And he goes, where's the soil logger? And I go, F I had it here. I go, you know, I don't have the soil. I said, you're coming back in there with me, man. There's no way I'm going back in there alone, you know. So he's like, all right. I'll come back in there with you, but luckily we started walking back in, and you know, like the little red oysters, the dogwood tag alder, it was it was hanging on that, so we didn't have to go back in, man. And I was a like, big time relieved. I made a decision in my head that I'm done working in the bush. There's a reason I got chased out of there, and uh, I, I I did continue to work that year right up until that contract was done, and I was only helping for that that contract company. So after that, I started working in the city. I was done. It took me a few years to go back camping. I think it took two years, I guess, for me to go back out camping and all that kind of stuff. And then I started learning um, the Anishinaabek teachings on Bigfoot. Here, we, we know him, his Musabe. We have songs. Uh, it was a relief. I could talk about it because I wasn't stupid. I wasn't insane. I wasn't, you know. I wasn't crazy. This is a being that our people always knew about and that he's always been there. They have always been here. The ancients passed down the belief that they are spirit and can appear and disappear at will. Uh, this occurrence happened September 17, 2012 in McDermott or Rocky Bay, Ontario. Uh, I was on my way to shoot Dark History Episode 2, the McDermott Train Tunnel episode. And uh, it was raining that day, and it was foggy, it was cool. 
but uh, the rain had stopped and the fog was clearing and uh, I remember pulling into the where the train tunnel was and uh, I got out and grabbed my um, camera and any other equipment I was going to use for the day. I started walking down towards the tunnel and I'm looking at the size of it because it's my first time being there. It's like 25 feet tall, this thing, at least 25 feet tall. And a uh, thousand foot long tunnel carved through the rocks. And uh, I was just amazed and I'm looking down the tunnel and uh, to my amazement I see this Sasquatch. Uh, it, it, starts out on the right hand side of the tunnel goes to the, and you clearly see it's walking um, from uh, right to left and uh, the odd thing I remember the odd thing too was that it was white or just off white the color of it it was really weird and I'm I remember thinking to geez I'm here to shoot ghosts so I'm, that's amazing like and I'm seeing a Sasquatch so I'm pulling out the camera trying to get it um, get it going as fast as I can so the first fastest thing I can do is hit the the photo button uh, so I open it up and hit the photo button and everything's fogged up because it was cool and uh, yeah I, I, I managed to take a photo but I just missed it by at least a second so I have a photo of a, a tunnel I don't have the the Sasquatch walking by but uh, I remember I asked my friend about it too is like why was this thing white because it remi reminded me of the Wampa ice monster on Empire Strikes Back and he says uh, he believes it was changing its uh, fur or its coat for the season like uh, other wild animals do and I remember from the size of this thing my estimate is it had to have been at least 17 feet tall based on its height and the height of the uh, tunnel itself. And that is my uh, Sasquatch encounter. Many have contacted me with their stories, not just locally, but from all over Canada and the United States. Yet one thing is for certain, it is my hope that one day we will have definitive proof. The sightings continue on a worldwide scale. The Sasquatch is found worldwide under different names. It is important to keep an open mind. As human beings, we can never know everything. Some mysteries exist. Some mysteries are revealed. Some mysteries will forever remain. Lake Superior and the forests surrounding it, in particular the land of the Nipigon, has its share of mystery. Deep within these woods something does dwell, whether spirit or creature, man or beast. Its myth draws in those who seek the story. As for Lake Superior and its tributaries, Something's out here.